Gresham College presents The New Normal, Rebalancing Our Priorities by Professor Kenneth Costa, Gresham Professor of Commerce. So it's wonderful to be, uh, be here. Thank you very much. So I want to talk a bit about the new normal. Now, we all know that Bob Diamond um, has an ability to capture newspaper headlines in a way in which I suspect that he didn't uh, wish for himself. Been the group executive of Barclays Bank since uh, 2011. Uh, he suffered the limelight a great deal since the crash, despite the fact that Barclays was one of the few banks that did not go cap in hand to the government. He's been widely quoted, but is perhaps best known for a comment made before the Cross Party Treasury Select Committee when he said, There was a period of remorse and apology for banks, but that period needs to be over. We need banks to be able to take risk working with the private sector in the UK. Now, I think it's fair to say that the reaction to this across the UK was not entirely positive. In fact, Mr. Diamond was widely criticised. However, what many people who took it upon themselves to criticise him seemingly failed to realise was that he was far from alone in holding that opinion. Jamie Dimon, the head of JP Morgan, made the same plea in a talk to us at the World Economic Forum in Davos at about the same time and was widely applauded by his peers for saying so. Terry Leahy, the now former chairman of uh, chief executive of Tesco and one of the most successful businessmen of our generation, told the Daily Telegraph that he feared that Britain was taking wealth creation for granted. John Cridlin, the director general of the CBI, has repeatedly said that Britain needs successful and growing companies and it, that it's vital that inter international corporations are based in the UK because without them, the whole country is the poorer. We should be championing business people, not attacking them, he said. And indeed, the Prime Minister himself said that the banks have become an easy scapegoat for the economic crisis. In other words, for all the personal opprobrium heaped on him, Bob Diamond was voicing a reasonably widespread and, to my mind, a perfectly defensible position. So I'd like to set my stall out on this issue straight away and say that as far as the argument is concerned, I'm firmly on the side of the Prime Minister, John Cridlin, Terry Lee, J.B. Diamond and Bob Diamond, Jamie Diamond and Bob Diamond. I do fear that there is an anti-business anti-commerce and particularly an anti-banking ethos in the country at the moment which is harmful to the interests of commerce and I think we need to move away from it. However, having said that, I'm nervous about the phrase there was a period of remorse that needs to be over because this, at least superficially, appears to suggest that remorse, a fundamentally moral response to a morally eroded problem, should be limited to a particular period of time and that we can, in effect, go back to the old normal, the way things were. And that, I think, is misleading. We should be under no illusion that we have just been through uh, and what we are recovering from. The financial crisis was no ordinary blip, no ordinarily uh, cyclical downturn. It was truly an epochal, seismic and, in fact, brought the Western economy almost to the very brink. Until we really truly get let go of the what I would call that ancien financial regime, it will be impossible to imagine or to create a new paradigm for commerce. Now, if there's one message that I've been trying to articulate in this series of Gresham lectures, it is that finance needs to reconnect with its ethical foundations. It cannot survive outside a moral framework. The crash was a painful example of what, what happens when it does. We do indeed need to move on, if only because becoming fixated on the past will prevent us from tackling the future. But we will not be able to tackle the future by ignoring the mistakes of the past. In other words, we need to go not back to normal, but towards the new normal and we need to do something about reordering our priorities. And this is the subject of the lecture this evening. So I want to unpack tonight what I mean by the new normal. 
what it consists of, and what we need to do to get there. And I want to begin by rehearsing one of my central arguments in these lectures of what it is to be human. And during these series, I've repeatedly emphasized that humans are composite beings, a mixture of different aspects. In particular, we are composite of the financial, the ethical, and of the spirit. Now, what do I mean by this? Briefly, the financial aspect is to be found in the fact that we want to do well. It's our nature to earn money, to prosper, to want to live in comfort. There is the invisible hand steering us to beneficial, profitable behavior. And there's nothing to be ashamed of in the desire to make money and to do well. Indeed, there is a moral imperative to create wealth. The shame comes when this aspect of our human nature eclipses all others. In particular, when it eclipses the second aspect of our human nature, our, nat our nature as ethical beings, we want to do good as well as doing well. On this note, and just, uh, just as an aside, it is quite right that so many people are up in arms about the government's plan to cap charity tax relief. You cannot simply siphon off the doing well part of human nature from the doing good part and expect them both to continue to prosper. Whatever the motivations for this may be, the impact of this policy will be to deter philanthropy. And as the chief executive of the Charities Aid Foundation, John Lowe, said, generous philanthropists across the country are demoralized by being branded tax dodgers. So there's a financial element and an ethical element, both of which are fundamental to human nature. But there's also the element of the spirit. Now, I do need to be very careful what I mean by this. By spirit, I do not narrowly mean spiritual or religious, although both of these can be included in the term. Rather, I mean spirit in a broad and inclusive way, using the word in much the same way as people talk about the spirit of an age, or doing something in the right spirit. What I mean is the zeitgeist, the prevalent cultural, intellectual and spiritual ambience of our society. Now that spirit may be hedonistic or ascetic. It could be selfish or it could be generous. It could be short term or it could be long term, rationalist or emotional, reserved or outgoing, or some combination of all of these. The important thing to realize is that no culture, no society, no individual is neutral or objective in such matters. We're all of us informed and animated by a particular spirit. And it's my hope that the spirit of our age will be both entrepreneurial and responsible, a spirit of rationality and of morality, a spirit of intelligent reflection and of intuition. In short, a spirit in which there is a better balance, a better rhythm of life. But I'm running ahead of myself. My key argument is that having recognized this diverse but linked aspect of human nature, we need to rebalance our priorities so that we pay serious attention to each different aspect. Let's begin with the financial aspect. What does the new normal look like? How do we reorder our financial priorities? We need an unapologetic attitude that generating wealth is a good, a renewed emphasis on commerce, investment, and entrepreneurship. So what does this mean for government? I need hardly remind anyone here that our finances are in a perilous state. In the three months uh, since to January this year, the unemployment rate for the 16 to 24 year olds rose by 16,000 to just over a million and currently stands at a staggering 22.5%. We are in grave danger of losing an entire generation to joblessness and all the social and psychological problems that come with it. The brute fact is that only business can create the jobs that the people really need. To its credit, the government is clearly recognizes this and has sounded many pro-business notes over the last two years and has made a number of pro-business moves. Government-sponsored job training creation schemes have clearly helped. And reducing regulatory complexity and rates of tax for smaller enterprises, cutting corporation tax are important measures. 
But government also needs to do more in providing funding for infrastructure projects, reducing red tape and making it easier for business to hire and, if necessary, to fire employees. In particular, we need to take an entirely new approach to the question of lending to the SMEs. And business is the only sustainable solution to our problem of joblessness. Business lending therefore becomes absolutely crucial. Regrettably, the level of SME lending or lending to SMEs has been woefully inadequate over the last few years. Prime example of where government can intervene by making direct equity loans to small businesses. Some may protest that this would be an example of government getting involved where it shouldn't. However, given the recent years, we have seen government get involved in the financial sector on an unprecedented scale without generating the growth needed for a sustainable recovery. I don't think it's at all Ill illegitimate for us to do the same on a much smaller scale when it comes to priming small uh, and medium-sized businesses. We need to avoid the debt fueled growth of SMEs. A new paradigm is needed of direct government involvement in the provision of growth equity for SMEs. Which leads me to my second point, in that education. Terry Leahy's observations are relevant. As you know, Terry Leahy uh, for, oversaw the creation of over 300,000 jobs when he was running Tesco and moreover gave employees shares and increased their salaries in real terms over this period. If anybody knows about job creation, it's him. Yet he has remarked that as far as he is concerned, all people that are taught about business, all that they're taught about is that these are dark satanic mills and fat cat bankers. Business as problem, rather business as solution. In contrast to this, he has said in respect for business and wealth creation needs to be taught at schools. Business should be a prominent part of the curriculum. If courses in business and commerce were integrated into the syllabus, it would help build the bedrock of understanding that would massively benefit future generations. And then there's the media issue. Far be it for me to suggest that certain sectors of the media are captured by the received anti-wisdom, anti-business wisdom of the age. But I do wonder, for example, how many people know, how many, for example, how many private sector jobs have been created during the duration of this parliament? It's around a half a million. It's good news. It's not good enough, but it's certainly a step in the right direction. However, there's been little celebration of this or analysis of how or why they came about and how this happened whilst the economy was ostensibly flatlining. Now, it's certainly not the job of the media to cheerlead for the government, but the fact is that just as schools and colleges have a role to play in educating the public about the mechanics and the aims and the successes of business and commerce, so does the media. And then it's our attitude to finance. In our cultural attitude to business and investment is poor, our attitude to banking and finance is truly lamentable. According to one survey last year, twice as many people said that investment banks do harm to the UK economy as they think benefit it. If we don't love business as much as a nation, we certainly don't love finance. Now, James Dyson, the British engineer and entrepreneur, makes an interesting uh, example. He told the Daily Mail last summer that bankers are guilty of an extreme perversion of capitalism. That makes a good headline and encourages those who or hardly need any encouragement to give banks a good kicking. But that is at best a partial view of Dyson's view of bankers. Listen to this. Dyson vacuum cleaners, he said, would not exist were it not for Mike Page, my bank manager, who personally lobbied an initially reluctant Lloyds Bank to lend me the 600,000 I needed for tooling the only way to start out on my own. It's clear, for UK technology to thrive, financial support is required, lenders and investors with patience and risk tolerance. It's a great example of how finance is and does and should work, and it should be celebrated. 
What it is to say is that when finance does what it should do, oiling the wheels of commerce, making adequate risk-adjusted returns for shareholders, providing an efficient service for all stakeholders, when it does that, then we need publicly to recognize and to celebrate it. These points collectively make my overarching argument about how we need to reorder our financial priorities. Government needs to do, as well as say, much more to get business activity going. The education system needs to pay much more serious attention to teaching what business is and what good it can do. The media needs to be less hostile and more encouraging about business activity. And the true role and significance and benefit of the finance sector needs to be publicly recognized and celebrated. Now, doing all this is necessary if we want to move on to the new normal, but it's not sufficient. Which leads me to the second point of my argument. Business is part of a wider society, not isolated from it. Accordingly, it cannot divorce itself from the moral universe in which we all operate. Now, Matthew Hancock, who has uh, participated in this series, in his work on the, mast the Masters of Nothing on the financial crash, said this, Businesses do not act in a moral vacuum. They are made up of human beings who all play their role in society. Like any other group of people, business leaders need to take responsibility for their actions, right or wrong. Whether legal or not, immoral actions within business should not be ignored just because there's a logo on the door. Now, what does this mean in practical terms? The first is that it means in changing the terms of the debate, or more precisely, recognizing that the terms of the debate must include moral terms. We can no longer allow technical complexity to evict the moral perspectives from the debate. For far too long, too many people have mistaken complexity for progress, believing that complex algorithms, reams of data, mind-bogglingly mind uh, confusing products are all that we need. Progressive innovation has become a self-authenticating justification in itself. Now, it's instructive that when PricewaterhouseCoopers went to Lehman Brothers after it collapsed in 2008, it took teams of 10 people about 10 days to start to understand actually what products they were dealing with. That's not understand what deals Lehman had actually done, it is understanding what products they were dealing with in the first place. That may be an extreme example, but it's symptomatic of a wider problem. The wider world before the crash was mesmerized by cyber solutions the idea that computers could do all that was needed, and computers, lest it needs to be saying, but I don't think it does, don't lend themselves to ethical discourse. So the first point here is simply to say that the new normal must reintroduce ethics into the conversation. That may take some people nervous, but so be it. In the long run, excluding ethics is a disaster. Second, and attendant on this, if we are serious about our need for ethics, we need to be serious about the ethical terms of our debate. A morally drained language will not serve us well. What I mean here can be put in concrete terms. I'm talking about talking about fellow feeling, responsibility, reciprocity, obligation, honour, duty, fairness, trust, thrift and the like. Most people are perfectly happy with some of these terms, words like responsibility or trust. Nonetheless, it's a feature of our age that in as far as we are confident using moral language, we are confident using it in the private sphere at home, with the family, amongst our friends. We tend to be more uneasy about using such terms in public, risking accusations of preaching, moralizing, hypocrisy. We take easily to a kind of liberalized utilitarianism in which people can do whatever makes them happy, provided it does not harm anyone else. But it's not good enough. It's a social benefit system, not a moral framework for our time. Now, that doesn't mean we should bang on about faith, hope and charity at board meetings. 
there are clearly some morally freighted terms that are better suited uh, to other realms of life. But it does mean that we need to recapture a once rich moral vocabulary in which people felt com comfortable talking about decency, honour, fidelity and respect. Now, if we're serious about bringing morals into the financial arena, we need to do it early and we need to do it well. Just as we need to teach more business at school, we need to teach more ethics in business schools, not simply as a bolt-on to serious business of making money, but as a central and vital part of learning what it is to do business. This sounds ambitious, but it's far from impossible. I find the example of Michael Sandel instructive. Sandel is a professor at Harvard University. Not only is his course on moral reasoning the most popular course in the Harvard's history, but his lectures, books, TV programs have all been watched and read by millions of people uh, outside the lecture hall. What Sandel shows is that not only is there a hunger for this kind of ethical engagement with the public, indeed with business issues, but that it can be done well and not as an additional extra to the kind of lives we normally lead, but as part of those lives. We need more Michael Sandels for the business world, embedding ethical thinking into the very marrow of our business lives. So if we're going to reorder our priorities in favour of ethical thinking, we need to embed morality within our regulation. This doesn't mean that regulation should talk about decency and honour. Rather, it means that questions of trust and responsibility, for example, are as relevant to regulation as they are to personal relationships. If the development of the Office for Budget Responsibility is anything to go by, this is clearly on the agenda of our time. Indeed, reforming corporate governance to place a greater emphasis on responsibility is one of the more positive messages to come out of the crash. So, Hancock uh, and Zahawi emphasize in their book, placing particular emphasis on the need for public protagonists to hold boards to account, to strengthen the role of non-executive directors, and to punish those managers and directors for particularly egregious examples of irresponsibility. The specific details of the nature of this kind of regulation need not detain us here. The key point is the headline one. For the financial system to be sustainable, and to regain public credibility, it has to be, and it has to be seen to be, ethically legitimate, obeying the same moral strictures and conventions as the rest of society. And then, however, as I've already said, ethics is too important to be left to the regulators. Indeed, if the events of recent years have told us anything, it is that good regulation, whether technical or even moral, is no substitute for good behaviour. Here is where we would benefit from clear understanding of the difference between the written and the unwritten rules. The former are pretty self-evident. Ethics passed into regulation or legislation so as to shape a system for the good. If we're not careful, however, we can place so much emphasis on the former that we actually strangle the latter. The latter being society's unwritten rules of responsibility and ethical behaviour. If that sounds vague, it needn't be. Just think about any aspect of your life, whether it is how you behave at home or at work or in public or in a club that you belong to or on public transport. You will realize that most of what you do is governed not by laws, but by unwritten rules, silent codes of conduct that you just pick up. In actual fact, public transport is a good example here. A generation or two ago, people naturally stood up for the aged or the infirm. They didn't eat smelly food, didn't put their feet on their chairs, and didn't play their music too loudly. There weren't any specific laws that told them not to do these things. They were just the social norms of the age. Today, public transport operators like London Underground feel it necessary to tell people not to do these things by means of large signs and posters that they put up on buses and trains and tubes. The posters are not wrong in themselves. No one could argue with the basic sentiment, respect other people. The problem is that we seem to be moving away from a culture of unwritten rules towards a culture of written ones. And while the intention may be good, 
the result is expensive, inefficient and ultimately inadequate. You cannot legislate people into civility and decency. Rather, you have to create a culture in which such behaviour is normalised. Encouragingly, policymakers are more and more inclined in that direction, talking about social norms, those standards and patterns of behaviour that become normalised through an organisation or a culture or a society without anyone actually having to legislate or regulate for them. Quite how one generates social norms and engenders a culture of moral responsibility is of course a huge and contentious issue. I've touched upon it on occasions in these lectures as it involves a number of things that are very important to me. Questions of leadership, of vision, of values, of communication. But however one does it, it's critically important that we recognise that good regulation, even if morally grounded, is not enough. We need an explicit emphasis on morality in business and we need to embed the moral discretions within that system. This then is the second element of the new normal. Prioritise the ethical by talking ethics and embedding it into the system, both in terms of regulation, corporate culture, individual behaviour, in such a way as enables and encourages morally responsible activity. Now, what about the third area of reprioritization, prioritization, the question of the spirit? There can be little doubt about what kinds of spirit has animated the economic world for so many years of late. They are the spirit of rationality and the spirit of self-centeredness. Rational choice theory, which states that people will elect to maximize personal advantage if given a free and informed choice, was the basis on which we all worked. This in turn was foundational for the efficient market hypothesis, which states that the market price for an asset is the best possible predictor of its price in the future because all the information is distilled into that price. Given these foundations, there was no need to ask any deeper questions about whether it was right, still less whether it corresponded to reality. People were rational, information was available, Calculations were made, prices reflected this, and the system worked. End of story. The sad fact, we now know, is that it wasn't the end of the story. These convictions themselves were the culmination of years in which the traditional discipline of economics, which emerged as a moral science, was abandoned in favour of imagined objectivity where people turned economics into mathematics, or at least tried to. Now, there's of course nothing wrong with mathematical rigour and computing power, but it's not a substitute for careful thought, nor crucially, for a realistic assessment of human nature. Put bluntly, no matter how subtle and complex the algorithms are, if you put garbage in, you'll get garbage out. So the spirit that animated this model was quite simply wrong. First, and most obviously in the context, we are not always rational. Indeed, anyone who thinks that humans are naturally and always rational creatures really hasn't spent much time with them. Thankfully, in response to this realization, a whole new discipline has emerged. Behavioral economics, behavioral finance, behavioral politics, basically anything behavioral. Anything that is based on how we actually do behave rather than how we think we do and how we think we ought to. The result is the revelation, at least it's come to be a revelation for some, that the rational spirit that had underpinned so much of our thinking and activity over recent decades is wrong, or at very least, inadequate. All of us, sometime or other, misperceive risk, being unable to calculate the true extent of the chances that we take. All of us have a tendency, of which we are blissfully unaware much of the time, to favour the evidence that confirms our existing biases. All of us have a tendency to go with the crowd and are capable of deluding ourselves that our decision is one of a courageous autonomy. So all this has helped to refashion the spirit of the age, at least in economic thinking, away from the nat rational spirit and towards the animal spirit. Now this phrase, at least as it's used in economic thought today, comes from Keynes' discussion on the general theory. 
The idea has been picked up recently, most prominently, in the book that we've referred to frequently, which is Animal Spirits by George Akerlof and Robert Schiller. Akerlof and Schiller argue that it is animal spirits, irrational, instinctive, unplanned, and often harmful forces within human nature, which actually drive financial events worldwide, and that accordingly governments cannot simply leave things to the market. I've said elsewhere in this series that while I welcome the turn from rational and rational mechanistic spirit towards an animal spirit, I also believe that it itself is misleading and unduly pessimistic. We may be driven by animal spirits, but we're also driven by a moral and a relational spirit. The idea that we are capable of rational reflection, no matter how instinctively driven our psychology is, and that the rational reflection leads us to a sense of human flourishing in which our doing well is inexorably tied up with our doing good with and for others. It should, I hope, be obvious that my emphasis on the importance of spirit in reordering our priorities is not, not some kind of spiritual distraction from the real world of finance or ethics, but rather that it's inextricably tied up with both. If we have an understanding of the human spirit in which humans are wholly rational when we aren't, we are setting ourselves up for big problems. If we have an understanding of the human spirit in which humans are purely self-interested, we are creating for ourselves an unduly individualistic and selfish society. But conversely, if we have an understanding of the human spirit in which humans are little more than an animal spirit, driven wholly by emotions and instincts, that are subconscious, then we are doing an equal disservice to what we're capable of. Alternatively, if we see the human spirit as I believe it really is, creaturely and not autonomous, dependent, not self-sufficient, relational, not individualistic, moral, not mechanical, unique, not mass-produced, accountable, not self-regulating, significant, not pointless, eternal, not temporal. If we can capture this vision accurately, we stand in a much better chance of reaching this new normal. So to summarize then, we cannot afford, literally cannot afford, to go back to the ancien financial regime. Business as usual, the old normal is not an option. But nor can we afford simply to get stuck in a rut of bashing business and bankers as if we were some kind of constructive response to the problems that we face. Rather, we need to move forward to a new normal by a reordering of our priorities so that they'll better reflect the complex, multi-layered reality of human nature. First, we need to respect the financial aspect of human nature. We need to acknowledge and value our inclination to do well and make every effort to encourage wealth creation as the only way out of our current economic crisis. Government needs to intervene more to support and to finance the SMEs, needs to invest in the kind of infrastructure that business development need, needs, and it needs to focus in particular on means by which businesses can take on and train the huge reserves of untapped talent and energy that exist particularly amongst young people. Respect the financial, recognize the ethical element of human nature. In particular, we need to embed ethical practices both in our regulation, as far as it's appropriate to do so, and in corporate and individual behavior, in such a way as to encourage morally responsible activity. And then we need to release the true human spirit, not only appreciating what that human spirit really is, but also the energizing potential of which it is capable. We need, in summary, to reorder our priorities by recognizing the financial, respecting the ethical, and releasing the spirit. Only then will we be able to move forward to the new normal. Thank you very much.
Um, hello, Professor. My name is uh, Mike Indy, and I'm a political blogger. Um, I was just wondering, um, in your lecture, you um, said that we should move away from a view of certain liberal values, particularly one in which the happiness of the individual is uh, central to what we pursue. And you've also praised actions this government has taken uh, towards a pro-business stance. Um, but several months ago, the key political leaders set out their own stalls on moral capitalism, and the Prime Minister and the Conservative Party were noticeably the last ones to do this, whilst uh, the Labour Party and um, the Liberal Democrats were more noticeably ahead. Um, how far do you feel, given that delay, um, uh, that, um, de uh, that Conservatives could carry this debate, and how far do you feel what you've outlined chimes with what's been set out so far in the political discourse regarding moral capitalism? Well, I don't want to get into too much of a party political uh, discussion on that, but it's a very good point. I think But what has happened, whatever one may say about the timing, and we may disagree on the timing issues, is that the major political parties have recognised, perhaps with language that is still awkward, because don't forget, what we're, we're struggling to find language at the moment to, to reflect what we're talking about and looking for a new paradigm, a new way in which capitalism can be made fit for purpose in the 21st century is only something we're beginning to look at because of an incredible shock that we've had from the financial system. Now, I think that the, the way in which the debate is moving is a good one because there is a search for values and there is a, a debate about what are the values that we as a community, as a society, regard as being important for the, not only the, the maximization of economic return, but also the way in which the common good of the, of the community, the nation, uh, whatever, will be served. So I think that the political debate is moving on, it's moving in the right direction, uh, because what it's doing is that it's recognizing that you, there is a simple argument which simply said, that human beings are purely, you know, in, in respect of their economic activity, purely financial and driven only by financial concerns, is actually weakening to what I hope will become a much more inclusive debate of not trying to separate out the financial, the ethical and, and, the, and the spirit part of a human being. Professor, if I could just ask for your reflections on two additional parts to that. Uh, I think the first is that to degree, the degree to which um, it could succeed if we do not address the quarterly reporting of businesses, which seems to drive a lot of the behaviour in parallel with the reduced time in which chief executives typically stay in, uh, uh, in office. And I think the second one, if I may put a uh, supplementary there, which is that in parallel, we see that the policy makers also require to be re-elected on a periodic basis of up to five years, I think, across Europe typically. And that necessarily isn't enough time to make these sorts of changes. Could you reflect on those two points, please? Yeah, I think in respect of the first, uh, I, I, I think that quarterly reporting um, uh, is, is something we should try as best we can following, I think, Unilever's example and just moving away from them. Why? Well, firstly, because it's a mindset of the short term. Secondly, it is feeding a volatility in the marketplace, which is not good. Now, the argument against is, you know, we need information all the time. Actually, we don't. What we need is judgment on the information that we've already got and enough information provided at reasonable intervals to be able to assess and to make those judgments. So I entirely agree with the view of moving away from quarterly reporting. Whether we'd ever get there, I mean, is a mountain to climb. But I think it's a right way, and a few bold companies setting the way will, I think, bring great relief uh, to, uh, to, to, to major corporations. And on the election of policymakers in five years, I mean, it is difficult. I, I mean, I don't know what the right answer is, is to that. Because, you know, in, a, in the case of of a board, I mean, we take the view that nine years is sort of more than enough. And it's the usual case. The first year, you sort of try and find where the coffee machine is. And the second year, you 
find someone to pour a cup of coffee for you. Third year, you complain about the coffee. But I mean, it's, a, it's getting used to the, the organizations that takes time. And I don't know where the, where the optimal inflection point is. Five years may be as bad or as good a compromise as any. Um, I was just wondering if you thought that these corporate social responsibility departments and companies are an example of companies separating out the human from the, well, the financial from the ethical. And do you think they're just a fad? Do you know, I, I honestly think, if I'm being perfectly uh, honest, that sort of 10 years ago, it was a, a sort of, a, you know, a must do. You know, everybody needs to have one. I think that this has changed. I think that there is a greater desire to embed the values of the organization into the whole ethos of the, of an, of, of the way an organization works. And I think that the interesting reason for that is that I think the younger people coming into the, into, the, into the workforce are themselves driving that and are looking to see, you know, are you authentic? Is what I see on the, on the tin actually what's in the tin? And I think that's having a major effect on the integration of the CSR activities into the way that an entire corporation acts. We, we're at the early stage and we're almost through the cynical piece. I'm not sure we're entirely through it yet. When these things were, you know, just cynically, you know, you, you have to have a mission statement, you have to have a CSR, you have to fill these things, to, a, to beginning to see people genuinely believing that this is a good way forward uh, for, uh, for all of us. You, you mentioned the um, complexity that was found when people tried to unravel the uh, Lehman Brothers uh, debacle, but surely the problem of, I'm not quite sure corruption is the right word, of the um, early part of this century was reflected all the way through the system because it's been in the papers twice so it must be true. There's a story about um, some poor woman in the United States earning something like $20,000 a year being given a loan to enable her to buy a house worth three quarters of a million dollars. Now, you know, unless you win the lottery every week, you're never going to, I mean, that doesn't make sense. Now, was the whole thing corrupt? And, you know, it's somewhere between uh, clearing out the Jane's tables and something rotten in the state of Denmark. And have we got past this, do you think? Or am I completely wrong in my suggestion that the, perhaps the first 10 years of this century really was a, a rotten and corrupt time? Well, we had a bad time. It wasn't entirely rotten. It was, as you say, halfway between the Orgeon stables and Denmark, where that would be, I don't know, mid-Europe somewhere. Um, I think that, I think we're coming through that. But I think the important bit is that we are learning the lessons of what went wrong. Um, not entirely, but there is every effort being made to try and understand how those lessons will affect our future behavior. Give me one last question, yeah. Professor, uh, my question is that are we um, trying to align financial gains, I would like to use the word, with our moralities and the values? If we are thinking about it, who is taking the initiatives and where <laughs> practical approach is being taken, I mean, where are we doing the things which will align our objectives which we are discussing now? Um, I think it's a very good question. I think firstly amongst the regulators, uh, I think there is a, a greater understanding of trying to, whereas previously it's all been very technical, of now trying to look at broader issues and you find cult worlds like such as culture, which is first being used, and now quite openly people are talking about ethics. So I think we're seeing it amongst our regulators. I think we're seeing it amongst the sort of normal debates that people are having and are saying, this isn't right. It's not a good thing to do, um, which are ethical debates. We're still quite uncomfortable with the way in which the debate is structured. But, but there is a debate going uh, on. And then I think, thirdly, individuals are beginning to sort of say to themselves, 
you know, we all, this is a small planet, we've all got to live on it, we've got finite resources, and we need to find a way of sharing them in an equitable way. And, you know, what is my contribution towards that? So I like the idea that at the grassroots, it's I want to do well, but I also want to do good, uh, which I think is gaining currency. And the more we talk about it, and the more we try and understand and grapple with these issues, the closer I think we'll get to its, to its answer. Well, thank you very much uh, uh, indeed. I got to go off to give uh, another, another lecture, my final, uh, final part, my last lecture here. Um, but thank you so much, and I really enjoyed it, and very grateful for having been given the opportunity to think through some of these issues uh, with you. So thank you very much. For all information, please visit www.gresham.ac.uk.